Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining me today for my talk. So uh, I'll be talking about Kubernetes jobs and a distributed, you know, workflow orchestration engine that we built at Unboxed. So, um, so starting off, um, so I work at Unboxed, which is <clears throat> an e-commerce discovery platform. So. Um, so basically, you know, uh, towards our approach to solving these complex e-commerce problems, we have come a long way with these products. So um, site search, browse, recommendations, and product information management. Uh, I work in the enterprise products team, where we bring big data, information retrieval, automation, and intuitive interfaces together to help our clients experience the power of scale. Unbox PIM is a recent uh, development, is a recent product that we recently launched. So, you know, uh, Unbox PIM is a one-stop solution to collect, manage, and enrich e-commerce data, and distribute it out to e-commerce channels and partners. An important aspect of Unbox PIM is its workflow automation engine, and today's plat uh, presentation is going to be all about that. So, uh, this is how my agenda looks like. I'll give an overview of the workflows, and then um, we'll talk about the objectives and the components of the workflow orchestration engine that we have built, and the final architecture, of course. And then we'll move on to the Kubernetes and its features, and which features have been used in which components of the orchestration engine. So um, beginning with the, uh, with the overview of the workflow. So a typical workflow in the e-commerce ingestion pipeline looks something like this. Here I have taken the example from an e-commerce brand aggregator. So say there's this guy who has his catalog coming from a lot of brands, and then he, and his end goal is to basically you know, publish it out to one or more e-commerce platforms. So, uh, so this is how his flow actually looks like. He gets his data from S3 into Unbox PIM, and here he filters it out uh, based on a particular brand. Based on the filters, it branches out into two different kind of operations that he decides. And you know, as we can see, uh, on one kind of a product, he applies this uh, operation called modify pricing, and then watermarks images, and so on. So you know, uh, the extent to which these workflows can uh, expand, can fan out, is unlimited, and it, it has to be highly configurable. So all that we need here is an automation engine, an engine that lets you configure your workflow and, and lets you automate it no matter what the scale is. So, uh, so what we have to build is a workflow automation engine. So these are the primary objectives we'll be looking at. It should be scalable and fault tolerant. It should enable time or event-based triggers and should also expose REST APIs for workflow configuration. The components of the engine are going to be a node, data streams, the workflow itself, event listeners, scheduler, and the orchestrator. We'll have a look at each, these, each of these components in detail in the coming slides. So starting off, a node can be seen as the most basic entity in the workflow. Every node contains a special business logic that has been applied on a finite stream of data it receives. A node constitutes of four logical steps internally. So configure takes, the, takes care of converting the configurations it receives into a finite stream of data and passes it on to the execute node. Execute has the business logic which is to be applied on this data and then and yeah, and, and the business logic which is there inside execute can either be an in-memory processing of the data or it can simply be hitting external APIs. The end goal is to transform the set of data that it receives. And, and again, the kind of data that is being moved across these stages of a node is finite. This is, uh, this is bounded data. Basically, it is some kind of batch processing is going on over here. The third step is init output metadata wherein, you know, um, the results which have been achieved in the execute state is being converted into some metadata. I'll explain in the next slide why metadata. And the finalized step is where you know, all kind of cleanup happens. And this is how, if a workflow has you know, a, a particular sequence, this is how the data flow looks like. Uh, the node from one gets transferred to the next one. Talking about the IO data streams, so uh, the communication between two nodes happens in the form of metadata. 
So uh, as we know in a workflow, the data which flows between two nodes has to be, you know, uh, one node may filter or simply process on a particular set of data, and that gets passed on to the next node. So here, what we do is we checkpoint this data, which you know uh, gets output from a particular node. And this checkpointing, if we start doing it for millions of data, it, it gets you know uh, it doesn't really scale. So what what we have designed is that you know uh, every node should output a set of metadata, and every node will have a logic to basically convert the metadata into the actual set of data that it should actually be processing on. Uh, there is another advantage with passing on metadata is that it can be checkpointed as well. In case you know uh, some kind of hardware failure or something happened, and you know your workflow just wakes up, it can simply start off from the last node that had executed. So uh, the output data streams is encoded in the third step, which is the init output metadata steps of a node, and it is decoded back in the configure step. Now, <clears throat> so um, after we have the grasp of the basic concepts involved in this workflow, the node and the streams, we can configure a workflow. So when we configure a workflow, these are the things which are needed. A directed acyclic graph, which is, you know, we configure several nodes, and then we define a particular sequence. It ca there can be fan outs and fan ins there. So Th that's what a DAG structure is all about. Uh, a workflow should have some trigger details. Based on what kind of a trigger should a workflow ac should actually start, it should, you know, it can be an event listener or it can be a scheduler. And the specific node configurations. So, uh, uh, you know, it can be something like uh, there is a node which works on the pricing, scales the pricing out there, you just pass on the thresholds. These can be static configurations. So each node, operates on some data. There can be two kinds of data. The static data is the configurations that you pass while configuring the workflow. And the dynamic data is the data that has been passed on by the previous node onto it. And this is the last and the most important component of the workflow orchestration engine is the orchestrator itself. So the orchestrator has some responsibilities. Uh, it has to react whenever a time trigger or a event listener lets it know that a particular workflow has to be started. It goes through the directed acyclic graph, which has been con configured inside the workflow, and starts the particular nodes. It also exposes some APIs out through which you know um, these triggers can be informed, and when the nodes are executing, they can checkpoint their information. We'll be looking at that information, uh, th that, that detail in the coming slides. Um, a workflow orchestrator is complemented by a workflow meta store, which can be an outside service, which has all the configurations related to all the workflows we have ever configured, and a persistence layer, of course, where all this, you know, all the checkpointed states on all this information is kept. Well, after having discussed all the components, all the building blocks involved in this, in this architecture, let's move on to the actual architecture there. So the orchestrator receives an event through one of the triggers and goes through the DAG structure of the workflow and starts a particular node. The node executes each of its internal steps and keeps on checkpointing the data back to the workflow orchestrator, which persists into DB. After each of its steps, the orchestrator basically the or orchestrator here only stands as a particular service, which starts a particular node and keeps on receiving events back from the node. After the finalized step of any node, it knows what next node has to be started. And one important aspect that I hadn't discussed till now here are the external microservices. So the, the execute step of the node, which actually is supposed to have all the business logic in it, may simply leverage all the external APIs you already have out there, all the business logic, all the processing logic you have already written in your system. The workflow will help you in automating this. So you know, uh, so this microservices find a, a very important place in this architecture as well. Now, you know, when uh, when I have actually <clears throat> describe the particular flow and the architecture of this um, system here. I'll go on to the technology which has been used to implement this. So yes, Kubernetes. So Kubernetes, as we all know, is a widely used container orchestrator. It's open source and it believes in managing applications and not machines. Deployment is a very common use case for Kubernetes, where Kubernetes deployment uh, controllers keep monitoring your application. And in case it goes down or something, Kubernetes does everything it can to auto-heal. So it will spin another container up and recover for itself. 
Here, deployment is not just about the initial launching of the container, but it's something much bigger in Kubernetes. Apart from deployment, it also lets us do much more. That we'll look up in the next slides. Kubernetes jobs. So Kubernetes jobs is a special feature which lets us run batch jobs in Kubernetes cluster. It differs from other controller objects like that of deployment because in a Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes environment, because it is <clears throat> managed as a task that has to run till completion, not like a de uh, deployment where it has to be continuously running. So here, Kubernetes makes sure that a Kubernetes job goes till the completion state. In case some kind of restarts happen or some kind of hardware failure happens, Kubernetes makes sure that all the jobs which are running and have not attained a completed or a failed state are restarted again. So it gets our responsibility to make sure that the jobs know that it can be restarted and it has to you know, check, start, um, res resume from a last checkpointed place. So it's useful for large computations and batch oriented tasks. And also, uh, you know, it falls, it's fault tolerance because Kubernetes uh, makes sure that it goes till the completion state. Another feature that we have used in this architecture are Kubernetes cron jobs. These are essentially Kubernetes jobs with the same fault tolerance, but with scheduler configurations. So basically, you can specify the same job configurations with, with a specific scheduler configuration, which is of the format of a Linux cron tab expression. And Kubernetes will make sure that that point of time, this job is started. So, uh, and everything else is a, a, um, exactly similar as Kubernetes jobs. And now, now we'll see which feature, like um, the Kubernetes jobs and the cron jobs have been used in what part of the architecture. So the event listener, event listener is a managed Kubernetes pod. It's a, uh, it, it's a de deployment object basically. So um, here, you know, uh, a set of jobs are running, long running jobs are running, which have a Kafka consumer running inside that. And that is listening on a particular topic, which has every event generated in your system whatsoever. To make this kind of a system work, we also need to have a particular topic where we are ingesting every special event in our system. The scheduler, as you all must have guessed already, it's a Kubernetes schedule job. The responsibility of this scheduler is to, is, this kind of a job is to just wake up whenever Kubernetes lets it know that it has to wake up and <clears throat> start a particular workflow. It lets, it, it lets the orchestrator know that this particular workflow has to start and the orchestrator knows everything else about the workflow. So it will take care of you know, uh, executing the nodes inside the workflow in the same sequence as we define in the DAG. The node, whenever an orchestrator starts a particular step in the workflow, that executes as a <clears throat> Kubernetes run to completion job, the Kubernetes bad job. So here, uh, it will be our responsibility that each node, each new business logic that we add to this architecture, we have to deploy that as a Docker image. And when we are configuring, we have to give the name of the Docker image, that's it. And the orchestrator will make sure that the Docker image has started as a Kubernetes job. And then it will be our Kubernetes, uh, the responsibility of the Kubernetes to make sure that it runs till completion. And yes, the orchestrator and every other microservices are running as Kubernetes pods. So they are highly available. So um, as I explained, if anything happens to them, Kubernetes will make sure that they get up. Um, the orchestrator is special in uh, one aspect that all the triggers that it receives from the uh, scheduler or event listener, they all go to a queue rather than you know uh, being served then and there for all obvious reasons that even if it's you know just in case down for even a second or something, no trigger should be missed out. So uh, that's how it is. Now, uh, as you all must have guessed by now, the orchestrator is a code, and that controls Kubernetes. So there's some library that we have used, uh, the Fabricate Kubernetes client. This lets you control Kubernetes through your code. So you can do everything that you can do with Kubernetes REST APIs using this library. So this is nothing but a wrapper over the Kubernetes REST lens, but it works really well. And <clears throat> that's the dependency out there. And yes, instead of YML files, it uses a well-structured, strictly typed Java objects to configure your jobs. It also exposes inter interfaces to filter, filter your jobs and pods based on a particular label or a metadata. Basically, <clears throat> Uh, everything that you could have done using Kubernetes com command line or REST APIs. So that's how it is. 
now what happens at scale <clears throat> so th this architecture was defined uh, designed for scale because we were using something else previously and that didn't used to scale that well and wasn't this much configurable either so uh, if the number of workflows executing in parallel in increases drastically it directly <clears throat> impacts the number of nodes for which resources should be allotted by kubernetes scaling kubernetes cluster is as easy as adding another instance to the cluster now resource allocation can be planned based on the expected number of parallel workflows running at any point of given time so uh, it's pr pretty easy for us uh, another aspect that i would i would want to highlight here is that you know uh, scaling by rate limiting so something that we learned over the years that you know um, in, in in case you experience a burst in traffic or a high traffic all of a sudden you might be tempted to scale your processing units your middlewares out but you know uh, what happens is this also exerts a higher amount of burst on your database or your persistence layer or the uh, downstream microservices now <clears throat> You, you might say that you will also scale the databases out, but in real, pra real life practice, what we have observed is that scaling out a database might be pretty easy. Scale it back scaling it back down is not so easy at all. So, you know, in that case, scaling by rate limiting works really well. So here, what, what you actually do is you make sure that the middle layer um, middleware through which you know um, each request has to go to has to be <clears throat> throttled at a particular parallelism so that can be 500 or 600 or something so you know um, that will ensure that even in the worst cases in the highest cases of bursts the actual number of parallel requests going on to your final persistence layers will be <clears throat> will be throttled at a given ma maximum so kubernetes helps you in rate limiting the processing layer as we can specify the upper cap on the number of pods or the resources that can be running parallelly, while every new node will be queued for future when the resource will be available, thereby limiting any kind of burst on the underlying DB or the microservices layers being used by the nodes. And some uh, good practices that we learned while uh, implementing this, um, the orchestration engine should be made platform agnostic. I'm not really sure platform is the right word here or not, but um, what, what I mean is that the orchestration engine should be written in a way that today if it is working with a Kubernetes cluster, tomorrow it can be working with other kind of <clears throat> uh, other kind of container or orchestrators as well. So, uh, so ba basically we should keep in mind uh, of, of this fact. Uh, cleaning up the pods in Kubernetes. So, you know, um, so what happens is when a job completes, no more pods are created, but the pods are not deleted either. Kubernetes keeps them around so that you can still view the logs of completed jobs and check for errors, warnings, or other diagnostic outputs. The job output also remains after it is completed so that you can view the status. But in our case, we will be <clears throat> anyways be managing the states of the nodes in much more excruciating detail and much more granular level. So these ghost states only take up resources inside the Kubernetes cluster. It's better to delete them. So um, you can have a look at the Kubernetes TTL controllers. Uh, you know, um, that's how the configuration goes inside the job configuration. That will, you know, make sure that the jobs are cleaned up. And yes, you'll have to back up your logs before the uh, pods are deleted. Otherwise, you'll be losing all the logs out there. Um, and yes, as I have described in the architecture <clears throat> slide, a node may simply rely on other microservices or an existing data pipeline for its data processing. This helps in offloading the responsibility to an external system, while the node, on the other hand, makes sure that the synchronous process is completed and lets the orchestrator know about the same, and the next nodes can be triggered. So uh, just in case you have some massively parallel jobs, this <clears throat> a node the code that you have written ins inside the node just that is not going to help you out you should you know take help of some external engines and yes the node can be you know checking out on some uh, on some metadata that you might have de devised in your system and uh, will will help you in sequentializing the process that's my team at unboxed and thank you very much you can uh, get in touch with me on my email id or on my twitter handle do we have time for questions there is actually time, one minute for questions, so. Questions in the room? There's one. There we go. 
Hi, thanks for your talk. Thank you. Um, one question I had, what was, what is the benefit of your system uh, against something like Apache Airflow or Luigi? Which so, um, as far as I know, um, Airflow does not give you, so uh, we have used Airflows in the past for managing, you know, a small scale or, you know, a very hard coded workflows. So uh, in that case, you know, Airflow takes its configurations only in the form of a Python program. Here, the software that we have, it exposes a UI to the clients and the clients want to drag and drop stuff and, you know, configure each node and make their own workflows. So there it won't really help unless you actually write another engine that converts this UI data into a Python code. That's one thing. Second thing is, uh, I don't really remember the name that Airflow uses for its parallelism. Uh, we have seen that at scale, uh, it starts trembling. It, it doesn't really work that well. Um, I don't remember the name of that component, but yes, uh, th there are some problems with that. So th that's how we were motivated to use Kubernetes in itself. The whole ecosystem would be around Kubernetes and the workflow itself. Okay, quickly. Do you guys plan to donate it to, to any? Uh, yes. So, uh, yes, I would love to donate this, but, uh, you know, uh, for, uh, uh, as in, you know, uh, when some, something goes out to the open source, it has to have a minimal standard of quality code out there. So, you know, uh, there is a particular team in my company uh, that actually reviews the code and all that. It's actually under review. And if they approve it, I'll de I would definitely love to, you know, op open source this. Okay, thank you very much, Abhishek. Thank you.